and start things off. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be welcoming you to today's session on, on speleothem magnetism. Uh, we're going to be kicking off the day with a, a keynote lecture from Larry Edwards, uh, who I'm very pleased to introduce. Larry is an isotope geochemist who's known for uh, his role in the development of modern uranium thorium dating methods and his application of these kinds of methods to the study of climate history and ocean chemistry. Uh, he uses cave deposits a lot as recorders of historic and prehistoric climate. And one of the things that I really enjoy about having him as a colleague is that when he's talking about his science, he often relates the climate histories that he's extracting from cave environments to those from ocean sediments and ice cores. And so this allows him to actually demonstrate how climate is changing in time and space in a really powerful way that many of us in, in our community actually do as well. Uh, Larry has won a dizzying array of, of scientific awards and recognitions. Uh, he's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's the recipient of the Day Prize. He's a Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow of many professional societies. Um, and here at the University of Minnesota, Larry is a Regents Professor, which is the highest honor that the university can bestow on his faculty. As more and more of our community begin to study speleothems to learn about past climate change, as well as geomagnetic field behavior, it's really a, a pleasure to, to welcome Larry here as one of our keynote speakers at this IRM meeting. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Larry. Thanks, thanks, Josh. Uh, that was a generous introduction and it's a, a pleasure to be here with a, a group. Uh, some of you I've collaborated with, but, but uh, generally a group of people that are working on um, related but but uh, but different topics. So um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uranium thorium dating, sometimes also referred to as thorium 230 dating. Same thing of these deposits covers a range of, of the last 650,000 years or so. So if you want to go deeper in time, uh, uranium lead dating, is the likely way to go, but this is covering the last 650,000 years. Um, so I'll um, just talk briefly about uh, cave deposits uh, and then the principles um, behind uranium thorium dating and then technical capabilities. I'll go back in time a little bit on this um, because um, those improvements in technical capabilities have been sort of important in, in actually being able to um, do the kinds of things we're, we're doing now with speleothems in terms of dating. Um, and then just a few examples. Um, there's some now classic examples from climate records. And then I've, I've sort of cherry picked some records that relate to um, environmental magnetism, recording of the geomagnetic field and speleothems. And so, I'm just gonna say up front that this, these are just ones that I know about because I've been involved in them. So I don't, no one, please don't get offended <laughs> if, if I'm not bringing your work to your attention, it's my, my ignorance. Uh, uh, so a few examples of that. And then um, the calibration of the rate of carbon time scale, um, which has been, um, been important. And, and this is of course related to um, your areas of expertise because um, carbon-14 um, changes depending on uh, magnetic shielding of cosmic rays that produce carbon-14. So um, that's where we're headed. Uh, you know, I've worked with hundreds of collaborators, um, so I can't, um, you know, acknowledge all of them, but these two are just um, incredible human beings. They both uh, passed away, but that I've been fortunate to um, come across. Um, and so Gary Comer on, on the left, um, he passed away 10, 15 years ago, um, but he founded Lands End Clothing Outlet, became a billionaire, um, is uh, purported to be the first, um, among the first group to go through the Northwest Passage um, without ice quarter uh, uh, ice cutter escort. 
Um, and when he did that in the early 2000s, he realized global warming was here and he set up the Gary Comer Science and Education Foundation. Um, and also in the process met Wally Broker. Both of them are from sort of modest um, families um, in Chicago and they become great, became great friends. And Wally of course is, or was the, the sort of Dean of Paleoceanography, Paleoclimate um, and uh, you know, climate change. Um, and so they, Wally actually contacted me in the early 2000s and, and, get, and basically gave us some funding from the, the Comer Foundation. And, and this was actually really critical. It came at just a key time, which um, allowed me to have the resources to sort of expand what we're doing with, uh, with speleothems largely in terms of climate record, but those, those two, um, really fantastic. Wally um, passed away in February of 2019, and I talked to him um, about a week before he passed away about our carbon-14 um, calibration, which I'll show you, which was um, really dear to his heart because he basically started this whole business. Um, okay, so just some characteristics of stalagmite records. So you can get fairly high resolution, and this could be in oxygen isotope measurements. That's very common. Also, ones involving environmental magnetism. You can get long records from hundreds of, of years uh, to tens of thousands of years. Wide geographic coverage on you know the, the most of the continents. Um, and then you can date them, um, at least some of them really well um, by this dating method we're gonna talk about. Um, and in cases there, in some cases there's annual banding preserved. And so you get some additional um, precision in age um, and they can be correlated to other sorts of records. Um, this, uh, the black here shows limestone bedrock. So there's potential for caves in all of these places. And this is a little bit outdated, um, but these are you know, about maybe 10 years ago. Um, these are localities where people had, had gotten, uh, gotten records of some sort. I'll talk a little bit about the, the Chinese ones um, and, and others. Um, just quickly, um, the way these formations form in cave, you have rainwater coming down, um, picks up uh, CO2, so it has high PCO2 and therefore is corrosive toward limestone, drips down into the cave. If the cave atmosphere is at least partially exchanging with the atmosphere, it will have lower PCO2 than the drip waters uh, and uh, CO2 will, will degas, um, saturating or supersaturating the waters in calcite. And then you have these formations, the ones growing up from the bottom. Stalagmites, we tend to um, look at those because they have simple stratigraphy. The ones from the top, stalactites, and not shown here, uh, flowstones, which are sheet like uh, formations. So we'll be focusing in on, on stalagmites. I didn't want to leave you with that cartoon. Here's um, you know, a beautiful figure by the Ian Fairchild that said I could, uh, gave me permission to use it in any context. So, um, so here, here's a, a beautiful picture from a Spanish cave. Um, here is a, a stalagmite. This happens to be from Toca de Boa Vista cave in Northeast Brazil. Um, and I, I'm just sort of initially putting it up here uh, uh, to, to show the stratigraphy of, of a stalagmite. And so it's, it's, it's basically a, a set of nested traffic cones from you know, down below uh, and then higher, higher, higher. I, you know, I don't know if this is a good example because uh, the, the traffic cones that is because a brilliant uh, member of the National Academy started asking me about 
you know, what I meant by traffic cones, but, <laughs> uh, and that person will go unmentioned, but <laughs> is a really brilliant person and didn't really understand my analogy. But anyways, hopefully you do. So younger layers down at the bottom and then, um, oh, sorry, older layers at the bottom and, and younger at the top. Um, these are dating holes. So typically one drills out tens to uh, hundreds of, uh, of milligrams um, for uh, these samples. And these are examples of the ages. This one happened to grow um, fairly rapidly at about 65,000, stopped for about, what, 25,000 years, uh, and then grew rapidly uh, from, uh, you know, right around 39, 38, 8,000. Actually, and these are um, the result of, so this is a, a, a dry area of Northeast Brazil, um, just south of the current intertropical convergence zone, the tropical rainfall belt. And these are times when that uh, tropical rainfall belt um, was pushed um, southward. Uh, and, and these are actually during um, ice rafting events in the North Atlantic, um, where this southward shift in the intertropical convergence zone has um, taken place. Shown here um, are luminescent bands. So these are uh, annual bands. Uh, and so they're, they're bunches of, of uh, it's not continuous all the way through here, but there are, um, there are annual bands in this and there are annual bands in many, in many uh, speleothems. Um, here's an example from Dunga. The, the left half of this is, is, uh, is cut off. So you're just seeing the right half and this shows sort of conventional. So back around 200,000 years ago, you see these, um, these drill holes, uranium thorium dates, and then oxygen isotopes can be um, uh, determined uh, on much smaller amounts. And so you see all of these little holes for, for oxygen isotopes. Um, so, Uranium thorium dating is based on the uh, 238 decay chain. So uh, uranium 238 is the ultimate parent, half-life about the same as the age of the earth, right? Four and a half billion years. Um, and then it decays through a whole set of intermediate daughters eventually to lead 206. And so um, uranium lead dating is in part based on uh, 238 decaying to the ultimate daughter led to 06, um, but we're picking off these two intermediate daughters, uranium-234 and two, uh, thorium-230 uh, in thorium-230 dating. And it takes advantage of the fact that these half-lives are a little bit shorter, 245,000 years for 234 and 75,000 years uh, for for 230, and so we're addressing these shorter time scales, right? The last, as it turns out, 650,000 uh, years. Um, and so the general idea is this, um, and it takes advantage of pretty amazing things. So uranium and thorium are both actinides, um, but under oxidizing conditions, uranium kicks into plus six oxidation state instead of the plus four oxidation state uh, and um, is, is soluble in surface waters, whereas thorium stays in the plus four oxidation state and has very, very low solubilities. And so surface waters, including the, the drip, drip waters and speleothems uh, have high uranium concentrations, low thorium concentrations, the calcite precipitates from these waters, basically maintaining that same relationship, high, high uranium and essentially no thorium. And then with time, thorium-230 ingrows. Um, now thorium-230, of course, as indicated here, um, by its half-life is also radioactive. Um, and so with time, it approaches a kind of a steady state value. And that's kind of the end of the chronometer. That's why you can't go past 
650,000. Um, right, so in terms of uranium and thorium, um, this, so you've got distilled water essentially, rainwater comes in and percolates through the soil and through the limestone, picks up uranium, um, but leaves behind the thorium, which is, is not uh, particularly soluble and goes down and you precipitate out um, high uranium, relatively high uranium and, um, and no thorium, thorium ingrows and that's the basis for the chronometer. Okay, so a, a question that comes up really commonly is, you know, why, uh, why speleothems? Why, are, why is uranium thorium appropriate to speleothems? And then you may know also corals. And it turns out that there's really a, an incredible bimodal distribution to sort of materials that you might want to date that, that are at the surface. And um, so you've got seawater here um, and uh, corals are, you know, basically have these high uranium concentrations, high uranium calcium, um, similar to, to seawater. Um, but um, mollusks are way down here. In fact, the, the, the uranium concentration, primary uranium concentration in a mollusk wasn't determined until we came up with these really um, uh, high sensitivity techniques using a mass spectrometer, right? Six, five orders of magnitude difference. And so um, along with this single clam, which was the first one that, that I measured, so this is just an old figure, um, most biogenic material. So biogenic calcite shells, bones, teeth, right? So appetite, all of that is, is you know, really low uranium concentration, uh, primary uranium concentration. And so that's, that's out in terms of the standard uranium thorium dating. But um, other surface waters uh, besides seawater um, are kind of, uh, you know, there's a range, but they're kind of lumped in here. Um, and calcite that precipitates inorganically um, from those waters is also over here. And so speleothems are over here. Uh, along with the corals, which are an exception among uh, biogenic materials. So the reason they're uh, suitable or can be suitable for dating high uranium uh, concentration, and I put that in quotes, it's tens of ppb up to, um, you know, some of them get up to, to, to many ppm, but in this, this range. Um, and, um, and they have, extremely low thorium because of the low solubility of thorium in water, right? Um, and so here's where if you want a speleothem to date, you don't want a dirty speleothem. You want stuff that's pure calcite, pure stuff that came from the water, contains uranium um, and not thorium. If you have detrital clay, we refer to that colloquially as, as, as dirty, uh, and that brings with it thorium uh, and you need to uh, correct for that. Um, and so relatively high uranium, low thorium if you get clean enough stuff, and then um, low porosity. So many of these samples have low por porosity, minimizes secondary alteration. Corals are kind of the opposite of this and we've, we've fought that. Um, uh, alteration uh, for from um, waters percolating through corals. So th this is what you're after. Um, right, and so I'll, I'll just point out that there are three isotopes involved in this, and I've been lumping these two, uh, uranium-238 and uranium-234 into one as just uranium, and I'm gonna to continue to do that in my example because I can get away with it. But just to mention, you have to measure 234, 238, and 230 to get, a, get an appropriate age. But I'm gonna just sort of ignore this for now in sort of simplifying the explanation. Okay, so if you just focus in on the, the main graph here, 
um, you've got time uh, and you've got 230 over 232. So you can envision that the soils and the bedrock above um, have a particular 230 over 238 ratio. Um, they could have a range, but basically relatively high. And then the waters percolate through and they fractionate uranium from thorium, right? So in this uh, picture, 230 over 238, uh, 230 is basically going to go to zero, right? 238 will, will be relatively high. This is just uranium dissolving in that in that water, uh, the water above the cave and thorium staying behind, you get down to some low value, which we, we presume is zero and we can correct for a little bit of initial stuff, um, initial thorium. Um, then the, the calcite precipitates out, closing the system chemically, and then with time, the thorium-230 ingrows. Um, and it then approaches a steady state value, which we refer to as secular equilibrium. Um, and um, because it's, uh, it's also radioactive and decaying away. So eventually it's decaying away just as fast as it's being produced. It's in secular equilibrium. It's in this steady state, state value. That's the end of the chronometer when you can no longer distinguish uh, from uh, between the 230-238 ratio of your sample and, and this steady state value. And so that's around with current technical techniques, that's around 650,000. So you come along later, you measure the 230 over 238 ratio, read over to here and, uh, and you get a time, All right? So that's, that's how that works. And then I've just put this in with a big X in it. Um, so detrital clay would have, you know, something like this steady state value and if you have a whiff of that detrital clay when this calcite first forms, then you're up off of zero in here. And that really screws you up. If you're, um, you, you have 1% detrital clay or so, um, you're, you're starting it at a thousand years old, right? So you, you really need to get rid of this stuff. There are ways of correcting, um, but they aren't, you know, that precise and so, uh, clays really uh, give you a problem. Okay, and then just, you know, next time you're thinking, boy, I did something new, I found something new, I've solved some puzzle, um, you know, great, enjoy it. But don't forget about everyone that came from you, bef came, came before. So here you have this curve, one minus e to the minus lambda t, and here, Rutherford and Saadi, you know, 120 years ago, had figured out this. This happens to be, I think, an isotope of, of uh, radon, which would have a half-life in the range of, of four days. And here they've got it. This is uh, six years after the discovery of radioactivity, uh, about a decade before isotopes were discovered about three decades before neutrons were discovered. And so here they have, you know, their actual individual data, which I, I know um, myself and, and, and you folks are all, you know, data is really important to you. Well, here's the, the, the individual data points that give you that. And then also, of course, maybe even more important, the standard um, exponential decay of an unsupported parent. Okay. so. Um, this steady state value is one uh, in which the activities of all of the nuclides in the decay chain, so the number of atoms of 238 times its decay constant, same for 234, same for 230, and then on down the line, those activities um, are, are all the same at, at the steady state value, which means that, um, so we typically talk about activity ratios instead of atomic ratios because that steady state value would be B1. Um, and it also means if you just take 230 and 238, so 
set that equal to that, rearrange. The, the atomic ratio of 230 to 238 is equal to um, the ratio of uh, their lambdas. That number is, is 10 to the minus five, right? So you have um, 230 concentrations at that steady state value, right? So at this value, um, 230 over 238 atomic is 10 to the minus five. 1.7 times 10 to the minus five, but 10 to the minus five, right? And so, and you're trying to measure things, you know, down, you might be measuring at, you know, 10 to the minus four of this value. So, right, so 230, the, the short is that 230 concentrations are really, really low. I mean, they can be in the range of uh, 10 to the uh, my parts in 10 to the minus, uh, or 10 to the 15th, right? So femtograms per gram. Um, also, um, you can, and I'll just make this point and we, I'm not gonna follow up on it, but if you have a material that you think is old and closed system, you can measure the mass ratio and calculate decay constant values, half-life values um, from that, uh, the, uh, the atomic ratio. Um, and so as it turns out, the uh, half-life of uranium-238 is well known. And so by measuring the atomic ratio, we can actually calculate uh, decay constant a half-life for 230, which we've done. And, and this has improved proved dating. Um, okay, so you have these really low 230 concentrations. Here's the whole history of, of these measurements related to thorium-230 dating. Originally, um, the uh, method for measuring 230 and, and also 234 um, was alpha counting. So you had to wait um, for um, parents to decay um, and then you would count the alpha particles given off. And because of the disconnect between these half-lives and lab counting times um, in a week, you're, uh, you're accessing one in 10 to the seventh of, of uh, the thorium-230 atoms in your sample. Um, and so that was the limitation of alpha counting. Not to say that this wasn't, you know, the biggest improvement was from not making any measurements to making measurements. So I'm not belittling this in any way. Um, and lots of discoveries made early on um, in the largely, well, in the 60s and 70s, a lot, lot of this was, was done. Um, so as, as a graduate student, I developed mass spectrometric methods um, for uh, measuring 230 and, and 234. And uh, I did that with uh, my advisor, Jerry Wasserberg and, and uh, Jim Chen, who was a research scientist at, at Caltech then, and we used thermal ionization. Um, and so we developed a method where one could ionize one out of a thousand atoms um, in a sample. Um, and this was like, you know, it sounds like not so great, one out of a thousand, but this was a, a, a huge improvement. Um, and so by thermal ionization, most of the sample, most of the atoms um, that are given off come off as neutrals, right? And so these were one out of a thousand came off as an ion, which could be accelerated down the flight tube and detected. Um, and, you know, this is an improvement of four orders of magnitude, right, over, over the earlier technique. Um, and then subsequent to that, um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers uh, came into play. And so in a plasma, you're basically ionizing everything. And so instead of one out of a thousand, you've got a hundred percent ionized. But the problem is how to get, this is outside the mass spectrometer. You got to get them in the mass spectrometer and in getting them into the mass spectrometer, you essentially have a pinhole 
in goes uh, the plasma, but you have to pump like crazy to maintain the vacuum. And so most of the ions that enter the, the machine get pumped out into the pumps. And so just by playing around with geometry and some other factors, gotten to one out of 50. So there's another factor of 20 here that's uh, come around in the last, um, you know, the last few decades. Okay, so this is just showing uncertainty in, in age um, with these different techniques, log scale, age, log scale, and we just, focus in, right? So this alpha counting is, is up here and then thermal ionization is here. And then the, the last uh, few improvements um, get us here. And this is under fairly ideal circumstances. So uh, you're in at a hundred years, you can basically get um, a precision to the year. Um, and then under ideal circumstances at, at a thousand years, um, plus or minus two years, 10 to the fourth years, plus or minus 10, uh, 10 to the fifth years, you're around plus or minus 300. And then as you get close to steady state, um, the errors get, get bigger and bigger. The analytical errors are, are still good, um, but the, your ability to distinguish uh, uh, the, the isotopic composition of your sample from the steady state value gets diminished. Um, so at 600,000, you can maybe get plus or minus 40,000. Um, and then at 650,000, you're sort of plus or minus 100,000. And that's you know, effectively sort of the end of the chronometer. Um, this shows uh, some examples of uh, thorium-230 uh, ages uh, with depth in a speleothem. Um, so these are a couple from Hulu Cave where a, a bunch of climate records have come. And you see this whole record here um, is presented here and then blown up in A, B, and C. Um, this is in the range sort of around 20,000. Uh, and you see we're getting uncertainties of about 60 years um, in, in many of these. They're not actually ideal, uh, an ideal situation, but pretty good. And you can see that everything's in stratigraphic order, right? Older ages for samples that are um, stratigraphically older all the way through A, B, C. Um, move forward another style from the same place. We're now in the 30, 40,000 year range. Here's the whole style. Here's um, ages with, with depth. Um, okay, so um, some examples, and this isn't you know, sort of directly related to, um, to magnetism. Um, but I thought I should put this up. Um, this is an auction isotope record um, from China. And it's, we have a record going back 640,000 years. This is just kind of the youngest portion of that. Um, and essentially I'm really glossing this over, but up in this diagram would be uh, more monsoon rainfall in the, in the whole monsoon system going all the way from the tropical Indo-Pacific Ocean um, onto you know, wherever the monsoon rains fall. It's from China. Um, and you can see in a gross sense, um, the monsoon follows summer solar insulation, which is this, this smooth curve here. Um, calculated from, from orbital parameters. This is from uh, Berger's uh, 1978 uh, paper. Um, and you can see in a gross sense um, with some key um, deviations, but in a gross sense, the higher the summer insulation, uh, the more intense the spring summer heating and the uh, 
the the wetter the monsoon season, something um, um, predicted by John Kutzbach in, in uh, 1981. John sadly uh, just passed away also. Um, but this was, uh, I mean, he was really happy with this because it confirmed his idea, you know, decades later. Um, if you zoom in, you see, uh, and so here's the last 60,000 years, you see all this millennial scale variation um, and the, that millennial scale variation is in phase with um, millennial scale variation in China. Uh, and there's abrupt climate change in here, this drop here, uh, most of that took place in two years. So it's not, you know, the day after tomorrow, but it's the, you know, the year after next, the, the bottom fell out, out of the monsoon here. And so I won't go into details there, but there's an incredible record at the millennial, centennial, decadal, yearly scale. Um, okay, some now getting into your neck of the woods. Um, and again, these are just cherry picked from what I happen to know. Um, so here's uh, a, a paper, uh, Feinberg et al, um, that looked at magnetic detection of flood layers. And so um, when a cave floods, um, that water can, um, can be muddy. Um, and as the waters recede, um, it leaves a layer of mud on the cave. Um, and so this would typically be in kind of a massive thunderstorm, that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and those detrital layers can be preserved as the speleothems continue to drip. And that's the case. This is in Spring Valley Caverns in Southeast Minnesota. And you can see really beautifully the magnetic detection of these layers. We've got great chronology on this because there's, there's annual banding and you can actually get thorium-230 ages pretty well. These are years CE, okay? And so um, in this paper, Josh is basically identifying these, um, these different magnetic layers. Um, this is, uh, you know, Ricardo and I were just talking about this and I was saying that, um, you know, I'm not gonna do this paper justice because I'm just aiming at, at the, the dating of the record. Um, but he uh, looked at the uh, South Atlantic anomaly through time, the last millennium and a half or so. And this, there are two styles from uh, central Brazil. You see the dating holes here. Um, and, um, and here are the dates with depth uh, for one, dates with depth, depth for the other. You see years now, we're not talking about, you know, tens of thousands of years, we're talking about, you know, 800 years um, or, or less. And here's um, the age versus depth record for, for each of these. Um, then uh, Mark Bourne worked on a sequence from, uh, West Virginia and looked at IRM um, in this speleothem. This is covering a, a time range from uh, basically the last interglacial, which is around 120,000 years um, to um, sort of a, a time during the last glacial period, not the glacial max, but during the last glacial period about 60,000 years ago. And you can see this generally sort of declining value. And the interpretation is that this, this is related to uh, magnetic minerals that uh, formed in the soil above. Um, and that, that uh, mineral formation was enhanced with higher precipitation, hence this this, uh, uh, the, the title there. Um, and there, there are other curves down here, but I just wanted to point out that that grossly, this IRM curve grossly follows the uh, carbon dioxide curve from, um, from Antarctica. 
Um, and so, th and that makes sense, higher carbon dioxide, more pumped up hydrologic system um, and lower uh, uh, carbon dioxide, lower precipitation in a very general sense. But this is just one of, of many, many papers that say, you know, carbon dioxide matters, right? So this is, um, this is one of those and, and an example um, in, in your field. Um, the Le Champ, um, so this paper is, I've got to say, um, is not adequately um, cited in the literature. <laughs> and this last paper with, um, you know, the Cooper et al. Uh, Adams event thing did not cite this paper and I was really um, unhappy with that. Um, so, um, Johan uh, Lasku um, looked at um, the magnetic properties um, across the Le Champ in a style from um, Crevice Cave, Missouri. And you see all of the inferred magnetic characteristics here. And then he dated this with uh, uranium thorium dating and got an age for kind of the, uh, uh, the uh, the most, uh, the, the, the peak, if you like, of the excursion of um, 41.6 plus or minus 0. 0.6 thousand years. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that. Let me see how I'm doing with time. Okay, I think we're gonna be able to go through with this. So if you remember that number, uh, you know, 41 or so, 41,000. Um, then I, just my last uh, example um, comes from uh, calibrating the radiocarbon time scale from uh, paired measurements of uranium thorium and carbon 14 in Hulu cave styles. Um, and we're recovering something like um, the atmospheric 1412 ratio back through time um, with these measurements. And this all started um, back with Wally, right? So it's in 1959. Um, in order to define the atmospheric 1412 ratio, uh, a large number of samples will have to be measured for many areas at closely spaced times. This will ne necessitate the cooperation of a number of laboratories. And so if you, you fast forward to um, February, uh, 2019, I was talking to Wally about um, this paper that, that, um, that we did that was basically, it's not the end of calibration because you can get much more precise than, than we got. Um, but um, it, it brought it to kind of a, a good position where we had a you know, reasonably precise calibration throughout the radiocarbon time range. And this is that calibration. So this is carbon-14 age. So these are calculated presuming a fixed 14-12 ratio, right? That's what a radiocarbon age is, presuming a, fi a, a fixed 14-12 ratio in the atmosphere. And then this on the, the x-axis is, um, is uh, what we consider true age, or in this case, it would be uranium thorium age. And you see here all of these values, right? And so if the radiocarbon age, if in fact, the 1412 ratio were, um, were fixed at the value that we've used, it's actually the 1850 value of the atmosphere, um, then everything would plot on this one-to-one -one line here. And you see everything's offset to the, the young side for radiocarbon ages or um, the old side for true ages, right? And, and that's in part because the Earth's magnetic field was weaker. Um, and so the shielding was weaker um, back, in, um, uh, back in, in time in general. There, there are other factors like uh, the carbon cycle has changed and so on and so forth, but it's in part because the Earth's magnetic field, as you go back tens of thousands of years, is weaker, right? So, and just to kind of finish the, the links between this, the stronger 
the magnetic field, the stronger the shielding, the fewer cosmic rays get in and cosmic rays are ultimately um, responsible for um, the production of carbon-14 in, in the atmosphere. So the stronger uh, the, uh, mag the magnetic shielding, the lower the 14-12 ratio, the weaker the magnetic shielding, the higher the ratio. There are other factors. I'm just totally glossing over this. But if you turn this data into a record of the 14-12 ratio in the atmosphere, this is what you get. So these are um, this is uh, calibration from dendrochronology, and then here are three Hulu speleothems. So one younger, intermediate, and then then older. Um, the you, you see these high values here. Um, this right, forty one thousand right, right here. That's the Lachamp right in there. Um, and then we think this could be Model Lake, this, this smaller peak. And then many of these kind of millennial scale ups and downs, we think may be, um, may be due to changes in magnetic shielding. Um, and, and, and so that's where uh, sort of the Earth's magnetic field comes in there are also changes in the carbon cycle, which are affecting this as well as, as other factors. Um, right. And I'll just make the comment that, um, so this, so in the Cooper et al paper that you may be familiar with where they talk about the Adams event, um, they basically, I mean, what they did that was really great was they, they put a floating tree ring chronology onto the Hulu curve. And so, and by doing that, they got much higher resolution right in this time frame where the Lachamp is just, just starting. Um, but the basic idea was already known, right? It's already known from this curve, which we did in, in 2018. And then all of the other parts of this, uh, you know, I, I I would just put in the realm of um, of interesting speculation, um, and so I think it's it's great to have it out there. But the basic thing that they did was add this um, this high resolution floating chronology to this kind of key bit of time. Okay, so, and I think, yeah, we're still gonna be sort of okay for questions. So the conclusions, um, well-chosen calcite, right? Low detrital concentration, low porosity um, can be dated uh, precisely um, with mass spectrometric techniques, particularly these uh, plasma mass spec, spec techniques. Sample sizes, tens of milligrams to hundreds of milligrams, um, range of chronometer 650,000. These are different uncertainties and you can just read these. I kind of stated them um, as we went through that, that one diagram. Um, and um, so therefore, if you've got the right samples, um, you can get precise chronologies in this sort of young time range for all sorts of things, um, climate, environmental conditions, characteristics of the geomagnetic field, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I will say this, that um, what really launched this kind of last episode that's just a, expanding right now is the development of these mass spectrometric techniques. Because all of a sudden, and I didn't emphasize this, you could go from you know tens of grams of samples, so a big hunk of your precious speleothem to, uh, to tens to hundreds of milligrams. And so once that became possible, um, sort of all these other things uh, became possible, but it started sort of slowly, um, you know, in the 90s, picked up a little steam in the early 2000s, and now it's going, going pretty strong. So I'll, I'll, 
finish with that and uh, I guess uh, uh, take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Larry, very much. Uh, that was a great talk. I know that there's going to be uh, some questions. Just to maybe start things off, uh, you know, the range that uh, Thorium-230 has of around 650,000 years is fantastic for exploring ideas around geomagnetic excursions and secular variation of the Earth's magnetic field within that time. One of the things that I know many of the people in our community are interested in doing is looking even further back uh, so we could start to grapple with high resolution records of full scale reversals in the past. Do you think that there's any chance of developing techniques possibly using other isotopic pairs to, to be able to date speleothems older than 650,000 years with similar levels of precision? Yeah, so, um, so the, the standard way is with uranium lead and um, there are issues with that, um, but they can be overcome with the right samples. So if you're looking at the, the Bruns Matayama, for example, you have a shot if you had the right sample. Um, and so you have to get samples that have high uranium lead ratio. Um, and the, the problem is, you know, we talk about initial 230 here and you sort of get rid of that by getting clean samples. Um, but there, it's difficult to get samples that don't have you know, significant common lead. And the um, addition uh, of radiogenic lead over these time scales is really low, right? The half-life of 238 is, is, uh, is four and a half billion years. And so you've got to find stuff that has high uranium lead ratio, high mu ratio for people that are into the uranium lead business, but high uranium lead ratio. And if you do that, you have a shot um, at getting you know, reasonably precise ages and, and potentially further back. Um, the Bruins would be the, the sort of most likely, the Bruins Matayama would be the most likely target. Um, but, and the problem as you go further back is that you have trouble finding speleothems that are going to be covering that. So getting to you know 800,000 or so is not that big of a deal um, in terms of finding stuff. But then you have to find stuff that has high, high uranium lead ratio. And but that I think is is certainly a possibility. I mean, you're aware of um, there are some possibilities in very unique circumstances of getting ages from the uranium-234, uranium-238 ratio. And we kind of work that out for uh, Devil's Hole, which is this, uh, where there's subaqueous speleothems um, in the, the groundwater in um, near Death Valley. Um, but it turns out that the Devil's Hole record goes back to around 700,000, <laughs> sort of just, just misses that. But there, there are possibilities of that. But I would say the most likely is for relatively young reversals and getting just the right uranium uh, lead ratios, getting high uranium lead ratios. Thanks. Uh, sorry, we had a slight power outage going on here in, in my neck of the woods. Uh, I think we have another question from Eric Font. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Larry, for this uh, exceptional and fascinating talk. Um, my question is about um, clean and dirty speleothem, because actually, as you said, um, clean speleothem are the best candidate for UTH dating. But for paleomagnetism, sometimes they are not so good because we are a few amount of magnetic mineral. And conversely, uh, dirty speleothem are a good candidate for paleomagnetism, but are very bad for UTH dating. So this is like a, a paradox. In, and uh, here, unfortunately, for dating, or fortunately for magnetism here in Portugal, we only mostly have dirty speleothem, which is quite uh, a problem for us. But I've seen some paper of some people trying to use some correction technique um, for example, trying to correct the, the, the amount or the concentration of detrital thorium 
into Speleotem, um, and they measure also in the bedrocks and in the and in the soils, and try to make some correction of this detrit auditorium to improve the dating of, of dirty Speleotem. And I would be happy to uh, to have your opinion on that because I think it's challenging and, and it's it's important for the future to to be able to date dirty Speleotem. Do you think that? We will be able to have a reliable age uh, for dirty spelotem in the future, or? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by reliable. So you can. So first, thanks for bringing up this point because I was actually going to make the point that the the samples that are good for dating may be just the samples that aren't so good for um, looking at magnetic properties, but. Um, you can do these corrections. So there are these isochron techniques, so on and so forth. And there's, you know, kind of a range of these things. Um, but the question is, um, how accurately can you make these corrections? So if you're after ballpark ages, you can get away with, you know, some of this. Um, and it, it all depends on how much detrital stuff that you, you have mixed in. So yeah, you can do that. And, and, and we've on occasion gone that direction where it's, you know, there's a key sample where that's dirty. And so we're gonna do everything we can to kind of uh, make these corrections, but it, it's, not, it's not ideal. Um, and so uh, sort of a couple other strategies. Um, so that um, sample from Spring Valley Caverns with those detrital layers, the stuff that's adjacent to the detrital layers can be dated really, really well. It's clean. And so you just kind of avoid the detrital layers. The other possibility that we've thought about, although we've never really come along, come across this situation, you might have um, styles from the same cave that are, you know, one has, you know, high detrital content and the other, other one's cleaner, but you can see, you can correlate them from something within their stratigraphy. Um, and so that might be possible. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone that's actually come up with that, but that is potentially a, a, a direction to go. So there's a, a few different ways you can proceed and, but it, it is, it is a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Uh, Yuval, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, thank you, Larry. I think it's the third time in a decade and a half I've heard this talk, and it's amazing to see how every time there's little nuances and improvements. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to go down the same path as Eric. Um, and I'm going to ask a question about two things that I'm not really an expert on, but I'm going to challenge Josh and Larry. So he talked about these dirty uh, speleothemes, the dirty layers, and at the same time, he, there are some, so that's the trito layers are usually soil derived, uh, soil contamination for us people who want to date the speleotheme, but uh, a gift for the uh, magnetism people. At the same time, there's now a lot of improvement in ways to kind of uh, quantitatively look at this the, the trital layers and see what's the you know contribution, different fractions of the soil, and and how much is the volume of the the, the, the traitors out of the uh, ball um, lamina or chunk of spilly thing you're looking at. So I think maybe. And this is just more of a challenge than uh, something that you can answer right away. It's like, will it be possible to use environmental magnetism to actually correct for the the trail contamination when dating a spilithi? Oh, I'll take it as a Josh. So any ideas? It, just to try and rephrase this, sir is the idea that there's a correlation between the magnetic properties of a, a speleothem and the, the sort of detrital thorium that may be present. 
And if you have a variable measure of that through the spilia then that you may be able to correct in some way. Uh, you can use environmental mechanism. Bait. You can use maybe IRM data or uh, um, other methods to kind of assess the amount of the treadle material and then better correct for it. Yeah, that's an that's an instead of a constant correction throughout the spilia theme, which is what people usually do. Yeah, there's a, I mean, that's a really interesting thought. Um, I mean, typically there's, there's sort of two ways that that correction is made. And, and one is by the sort of the common thorium that would be contained in those yeah. layers. So it's, 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 you know, that's a direct measure of, you know, sort of extra thorium that's kicking around. And the magnetic, uh, I would guess, and Josh may have some thoughts on this, but the magnetic properties would be more, I think, indirect. Um, and so typically one uses thorium. Um, the, there's, there's an interesting aspect of that though. So there's thorium that could be in the water that, you know, a small amount that could be dissolved. And then there's thorium that's actually in the detrital minerals. Um, and so people have tried to distinguish between these two different types of thorium. And so they use aluminum as, a, um, as an element that tracks the thorium that's in the detrital layers. Um, so there are probably better ways of getting at this than um, than uh, magnetic characteristics, but it's you bring up a really, really interesting point because those detrital layers, and let me see if I can pull this up. Yeah, so those detrital layers, um, you, you can't see it too well in here, um, but those, the trital layers, they're, they're washed off from the center as the new drips fall on top of this recently deposited yeah. uh, uh, clay layer. It kind of washes away, it kind of wafts away from the center. And so the detrital layers tend to be a little thicker away from the center. Um, and so we actually have on this particular, a, a speleothem from this particular cave, we actually have put together um, a, a series of measurements from the clean part in the middle to the dirtier parts on the side that have more detrital material and made corrections for this initial thorium that way. And so that gets back to one of the earlier questions. Um, you know, so if you do have detrital stuff, you know, one strategy is to um, is to look at samples of the same age that have different amounts of detrital, and you, then you can regress, the, referred to as isochron methods, to get the initial amount of of two thirty. So that's that's one method. There's also another method. Um, so I'm now kind of going back to this this earlier question. Um, so ages have to be in stratigraphic order. And so if you have a, a dirty sample in among a bunch of clean samples, yeah. um, then um, you can correct for thorium-230 to get that sample in stratigraphic order. And it gives you an idea of the isotopic characteristics of, 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 of that sample. So there's you know, there's a few ways of teasing this out. In, in the end, um, there, there are always uncertainties and it's a bigger problem for younger stuff, right? Because, um, because you're the, the amount, for younger stuff, the amount of uh, thorium-230, uh, the radiogenic-230 is small. And so for a given amount of initial-230, the, the fraction of 230 uh, uh, coming from, you know, the, um, the radiogenic, the radiogenic fraction is smaller. So it's a, a, a big problem. This, uh, this paper was actually, um, 
pretty amazing in that the initial 230 wasn't a problem, uh, even though these samples are so young. Thanks. Maybe we have time for one last question. I think Kathy has her hand up. Yeah, I have a question. That was a, a lovely overview. Thank you, Larry. Um, my question is actually about uh, what are the prospects for getting many more records of something like the Le Champ interval? Because you show this lovely radiocarbon calibration and all these fluctuations between about 40,000 and 20,000 years ago. And in the magnetic work we do in trying to reconstruct the, the, the dipole moment variations, the chronology is the, the biggest constraint. We just don't have accurate enough dates to be able to resolve many of those small fluctuations. Um, Aspelia sends the answer to this, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there, there are certainly possibilities. I mean, you just have to find um, the right samples that cover the particular time range of, of interest. I mean, the Mono Lake excursion might be one that, that, that people might wanna go, go after. Um, so there are plenty of samples that cover that time range. You want them that, uh, you want samples that are growing fast enough so you can resolve the you know, high growth rate. You can resolve the, the subtle variations in the magnetic field that you're after. Um, and so this one that Yoan worked at, you know, it just fit the bill. Mm -hmm. Had high uranium concentrations, and I've I've always kind of pushed back at the other end of this um, because you know you really have to sacrifice if if you need large samples, you've got to sacrifice a lot of precious stuff, um, which was was done in 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 the last coup at all work. Um, and so to the extent that the magnetic measurements can be made on smaller and smaller samples, that makes the problem easier. But I think, you know, the short answer to your question is, yeah, we just have to look around and find the right samples. But we've got lots of samples, say, that, you know, cover possible time ranges of, of Mono Lake, for example. Mm -hmm. And those would be globally distributed? Uh, yeah, you could find them in, in many, many places. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I'll, I'll just say that if, if people have, uh, projects that involve, uh, speleothems, you know, we, you know, just, uh, contact me and if there's an easy way to, um, you know, do a few trial dates to see where we are. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of take that on. That's a great offer. Thanks, Larry. That was really yeah. kind. Um, I think that's it for, for our time at the moment. Uh, we were originally scheduled to wrap up around eight, but the, the questions were great. Um, we planned for a, a 15 minute uh, break. And then we're going to come back and we have some other speakers that are going to continue to talk about the paleomagnetic and environmental magnetic uh, applications of speleothem magnetism. Uh, so it's about 810 right now. Why don't we all agree to come back at 825 and we will get started. And Larry, thank you again for your talk. <laughs>